And so uh, from this point forward, be on your best behavior. And we are excited to bring you Chuck Fink. Welcome tonight to tonight's storytelling showcase, everyone. We're spotlighting the talents of six newly minted graduates from my fall storytelling class at Ollie. I know I'm going to sound a little strange when I say this, but I love teaching this class on Ollie. The, the uh, excuse me, on Zoom. The Zoom break rooms enabled this group of people to come together as a community, a community of friends, a community of storytellers, and that enabled them to develop and to improve their stories. Before we go any further, I'd like to put a, a special shout out to Catherine Frank, our Ollie Executive Director, whose support, uh, great support, enabled the show to occur tonight. And I also want to thank Hannah. Hannah has been just so helpful in producing this show. Everything that appears right is because of Hannah, and anything that doesn't work well is not because of Hannah, it's because of technology. We want to leave Hannah and her ghosts free from any kind of blame. So, tonight, um, you all are in for uh, just a fun night of stories. Two of our class people, uh, Pamela Wolf and Victoria Bender, are not able to be here with us tonight, but they're here in spirit. Now, what's really strange about tonight, it will seem like these folks have much experience on the stage telling stories. However, this is their first time in public sharing their stories. So just keep in mind the courage that this takes. And now I'd like to introduce to you the members of the class of 2020 from our storytelling class at Ollie. So first up, and uh, I would like you each to say hi to our uh, group and come off mute when you do so. First off is Kay Loveland. Kay? Yeah, hi everybody. I hope you enjoy the story. We had a good time making it up and it's real. It really happened. <laughs> Thank you, Kay. And Kay is about to go on mute and our next teller to appear is Ann Jones. Ann? Hi everyone, uh, to on, on, on Zoom from Chicago. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Ann, for staying awake in Chicago just for this. Our third teller is Lois Penn. Lois, you want to say hi? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. And next up is Patrick Irwin, storyteller extraordinaire. Patrick? Hi, everybody. I uh, hope everybody has their drink in hand and ready for us. <laughs> and then we have Bill the Rock, Boomer Bill. Bill, you want to say hi? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. We're re, uh, reinvigorating the swamp up here. <laughs> and our final storyteller is also coming from a pretty far away place, Judy Keeler, all the way from Helena, Montana. Judy, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. It's Judy from Montana, and it's a beautiful day here. Big Sky Country is awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. And now, uh, our very first teller is a good friend, and she has so many stories of famous people that she's met over the years, including people like Billie Jean King, Stephen Stills, Rosalind Carter, and even Elton John. But tonight, her story is going to reveal her true passion, and her passion is human beings best friends. So now I'm going to shut up and let Kay Loveland share this special, special story with you. Ladies and gentlemen, Kay Loveland and her best friend, Rowan. This is a story that I like to call the perilous pelican pursuit. So finally, I have arrived for two glorious weeks of vacation at Hilton Head Island, South Carolina with its endless beaches, glorious sunsets, and some good seafood. It's February, 2019, and the past few years have really been pretty tough. Um, four weeks before I got here, my 97-year-old mother passed away. Two months before that, the dog of my soul, Misha, a beautiful white golden doodle, also passed away from cancer. A year before that, my 100-year-old father also died. And I'm still left with the constant ache of the death of my husband eight years ago. So if anybody was ever ready for a vacation, it's this person right here. I am hopeful that I'm going to feel better 
And as soon as I get to Hilton Head and I see that ocean, I can feel some of that angst and sadness started to slough off my skin, slough off of me like old dry skin. And I'm just thinking, okay, things are going to get better. This is going to be great. So the first morning, I decide that I'm going to take my constant sidekick, Rowan, who is my 65-pound, red, fluffy, golden doodle, down to the beach for an early morning walk. Now, mind you, the day before I'd gone to PetSmart, and I had gotten the strongest halter possible and the thickest leash possible because Rowan has a predilection to get in the ocean and chase the birds a little bit. And I wanted to make sure she was strongly attached to me and we were going to have no mishaps. Now, it was a February day and it was the morning, so it was barely 50 degrees. And I am bundled up with long pants and some good shoes and several layers of shirts and a sweatshirt and a nice hat. And even then, the wind is blowing and it's pretty cool. Once we take that walk of a block to the beach and cross over the bridge and I see that sand and Rowan's tail perks up and her nose starts twitching, I think, yes, I'm here. I'm at the beach. Life is good. It's going to be wonderful. And we had the beach mostly to ourselves because, you know, it is the winter and there weren't that many people. And you know, we passed a few people, but we are walking and I'm just having the best time. And then we come across a couple. And the man is looking out of his binoculars out into the ocean. And the woman stops us and she says, oh, what a pretty dog you have. What's its name? And I said, well, her name is Rowan. She says, well, she said the, the patrol, the Hilton Head patrol just came by. And you're not going to believe it but they just now spotted three sharks out in the ocean. And, and Eugene here is trying to spot them. Eugene, honey, have you seen any of the sharks? And Eugene put down his binoculars and looked and he said, well, hello. He said, you know, I think I may have spotted one. There was a big fin, but I'm not sure, but I think I spotted one. And Missy turns to us and she says, now, honey, she said, you and that nice dog do not go in the water. First of all, it's frigid and you'll get hypothermia. She said, and second of all, you sure do not want to be eaten by those sharks. So you and that dog, you just stay out of the water. And the patrol told us that nobody goes in the water. I said, yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have no intention of going in the water. So I decide we'll walk up further on the beach, farther away from the water. And so we're just walking along, Rowan and I, and oh, her nose is twitching and she's looking out and looking at the ocean and I'm looking at the waves and it's just a lovely, lovely time. Then all of a sudden, I feel like my shoulder is being pulled out of its socket and I fall flat on my face in the sand. And I look up with sand in my mouth, and there's my dog, Rowan. And she is already in the water, chasing a pelican that's flying out into the ocean. And I get to my feet, and I scream at the top of my voice, Rowan, Rowan, get back here now. Rowan, you come back here. Rowan, come back, come back, Rowan. She doesn't pay any attention to me. She either can't hear me, or she does not want to hear me. I do not know what to do. I get into the water up to my knees and it is so cold. I don't know if you've ever felt stinging nettles, but that's what the water feels like on my legs. It is so, so cold. And every so often a wave comes and knocks at me and I'm looking at Rowan and she's getting farther away. And then I turn and I see there's a crowd collecting on the beach. There's about nine or 10 people. And I scream to them and I'm crying. And I said, please, somebody help me. Please, somebody do something. Please help me. Please help me. Please, somebody do something. Please. Nobody moves. One woman finally holds up her phone. And I think that means she's calling 911. But nobody budges. And I turn back to the ocean and I see that Rowan is so far out that her head is about the size of a little ping pong ball. I don't know what to do. I rush in to the shore 
and I see the Tottlemeyers, and I think, oh, maybe they'll help me. And I said, please, can you all help me? And Mr. Tottlemeyer, Eugene says, yes, I'll help you. And he steps forward. Immediately, Missy grabs his arm and says, Eugene Tottlemeyer, you are not going in that ocean. You will get hypothermia. Not to mention, you know darn well that there are three sharks in there, and I do not want you eaten by a shark, and you are not going in that ocean. Eugene shrugs at me. He does hand me a small boogie board, and he says to me, take off your sweatshirt or you'll drown. So I rip off my sweatshirt, but I keep the rest of my clothes on, and I run back into the water. But the ladies in the crowd and a man, I hear their voices saying, no, no, don't go, you'll die. No, don't do it, no. I'm not gonna listen to them. I run back in the water and I stop. I can still see Rowan way, way out, but she's not swimming, her head's just bobbing. And I think, what am I gonna do? I'm 67 years old. I have multiple sclerosis. That leaves me tired most of the time. My endurance is very low. And I have not swum any distance at all since I was about nine years old. What am I gonna do? I finally decide I cannot watch and experience one more loss of one more being that I love. I will not. I cannot and I will not. So I put the boogie board under my chest and I start to swim and I kick and I swim and I kick and I swim and it's so cold. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if y'all seen the movie Jaws, but I remember the three sharks that are out in the water and I'm getting out to where they were spotted. And I have the vision of kicking feet and sharks eating off my legs. And I am petrified every kick that I take. And then I look out at Rowan and I'm petrified she's gonna drown. And then I kick my feet and I think about the sharks, but I'm gonna keep going anyway. So I've moved my arms and I kick my feet. And finally, I get about a half of a football field away. I've been swimming about 20 minutes by now. Rowan is bobbing up and down and she disappears under the water. She's gone. And I think to myself, oh my God, the sharks have gotten her or she's drowned. What do I do? Do I turn back? Do I keep going? I don't know what to do, but I just kept going. I don't know why. And I did my crawl and I did my kicking. And a couple seconds later, up bobs a red head. And I think, oh, She's there, she's still there. I throw away the boogie board and I swim as fast as I can. I swim like I've never swum before. And just as I get about to where Rowan is, she goes under the water again. So I dive into that really cold water and I reach my arm down and I can just barely feel the top of the halter and I grab it, but all of a sudden, I'm going down too, because it's 65 pounds of inert dog who's not moving, and she's heavy, and she's pulling me down with her. And I'm thinking, it's gonna be me or her. I'm gonna have to let go and let her drown, or else I'm gonna drown. But I decide I'm gonna try once more with everything I've got. So with the determination of my mother, And with the confidence of my father and with the trust of my dog, Misha, and with love of my late husband, Bruce, I kick as hard as I can. I kick and I splash and I kick and I pull and I kick. And somehow, and I don't know how, I pull that dog up to the water, up to the surface. And I pull myself up to the surface. And I'm holding on to her as tightly as I can but she's not moving and she's not breathing. And so I squeeze her chest. That's the only thing I can think of is to do a doggy Heimlich maneuver. And I squeeze at her chest and I go, Rowan, Rowan, wake up. 
and I put my mouth totally over her nose and her mouth and I breathe into it and breathe and breathe and I squeeze her chest and I shake her and I say, Rowan, I love you, Rowan, Rowan, Rowan. And after what seems like an eternity, she coughs and a whole bunch of water comes out of her mouth and she opens her eyes and she's terrified and she's not moving and she's so cold to the touch. I don't even know if she recognizes me right then. So then I'm going, okay, how are we gonna get back a half a mile to shore if she can't swim and I don't have the boogie board? So what I decide, I know, I'm gonna put her in front of me and push her and then I'm gonna kick and then I'm gonna push her and I'm gonna kick. So that's what we do. I push her and kick and before she sinks again, I push her again and I kick. And we go on that way for about, I'd say 10 minutes or so. And then all of a sudden, Mish Rowan starts to swim all by herself. And she starts swimming towards the shore. And I'm so glad. And so she's swimming ahead of me and I'm swimming. But in about five minutes, I can't swim anymore. I can't feel my body. I can't take a breath. I'm pretty sure I must have hypothermia. And I look toward shore and I see the EMT truck and I see the people on shore. And with the loudest voice that I could muster, I go, help, help, help. Nobody moves. I don't think they heard me. But one being heard me. Rowan turns around and sees that I'm not with her. She circles around and swims to me and comes by my side. I grab onto her collar and Rowan tows me the rest of the way to the shore. I get to the shore. I can't feel my body. I can't stand up. I think everybody's applauding and saying I'm a hero, but I'm just crying my eyes out. And somebody takes Rowan away from me and the EMT people come and grab me and take me to the ambulance and tell me to get out of my clothes, put warming blankets on, turn the heat on. And the EMT person says to me, the man, he says, I'm so sorry we couldn't let anybody in the water because it's against the rule when sharks have been spotted. He said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 67. He said, holy she. <laughs> he said, how in the world, lady? You should have hypothermia. You should be dead. There's no way you could have done that. How did you do that? And I said, well, I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone. Where's my dog? Where's my Rowan? I want to make sure she's okay. And all of a sudden, I see a streak of red running across the beach toward the ambulance. And then I see the Rowan head bouncing up and down, looking in the window, trying to see me. And the EMT person opens the door and 65 pounds of wet, cold, golden doodle leaps into my lap and licks my head, licks my nose, licks my face, licks my chest, and plops down in my leg. And I put my arms around that wet red golden doodle and I said, I love you. And I knew that we were gonna be all right. We had saved each other's life. The end. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful story, Kay. Thank you so much. I swear every time I hear that, and I've heard it a lot, I weep. That's such a powerful story. Thank you. Our next teller, Ann Jones, is coming all the way from Chicago, just so you can hear her story. Ann was a graceful rock of quiet confidence, giving strong support to all of her peers in our class. Now, before I heard her story, I wondered to myself, where did this woman get all, get all of her strength? Well, you're about to find out. So join me in listening to Anne tell her story, and then you'll know the source of Anne's strengths 
and her many talents. Ladies and gentlemen, put your virtual hands together for Ann Jones. Um, I, my story began last February when I was talking to my brother up in Michigan. He's a um, surgeon up there and I was, we talk about once a week and we were chatting and he said to me, so Ann, what are you doing to prepare for the coronavirus? I said, what are you talking about? He says, you know, the coronavirus, the, the, the pandemic. And I said, uh, uh, nothing, or what are you doing? And he goes, well, and you know, we've we're starting to shelter in place. We've been to um, Walmart and picked up our supplies, and we've got uh, we've stocked up, and we're staying at home. I said, "Are you kidding?" And he said, "No." I said, "Do you really think this is serious?" And he said, "Yes." Okay. And so we, then he started to tell me some um, um, data points. One was his son-in-law worked for the World Bank, and they had been told in January to cut back on international travel, particularly to Asia. And then his wife, Mika, happens to be Italian, and Mika's family was in quarantine in Northern Italy. And so I got off the phone a little shaken by the conversation. So I called my sister and we talked about it. We said, do you really think this is serious? And we kind of thought maybe he was overreacting a little bit. But I have to admit, I did make a trip to Target and picked up a few supplies, a few paper products, some, some canned goods and whatnot. And a week went by and I was a little bit more standoffish in stores and whatnot. And I talked to him the following week and he, again, he brought it up. He said, what are you doing to prepare for the pandemic? And I said, do you really think this is serious, Rob? And he said, yeah, I do. I really think you need to be careful. And I said, well, I'm, I'm supposed to go to the theater tomorrow. He said, no, no, you do not go to the theater. Now my brother's not one to tell me what to do. And I was like, sort of taken back. I said, really? He said, no, do not do that. And I was like, okay. So I called my friend and we talked about it and we decided to cancel our theater situation. And then a couple of days later, um, you know, I was getting a little more uncomfortable with the news and I'm hearing a little bit more. And then I can remember it was March 11th. I remember the date. It started out, we went, I went to a board meeting at um, the little local history museum where I'm on the board and we were talking about whether we needed to cancel programs or not. And we started social distancing and then I came home and then the bombs started to drop. <laughs> World Health Organization announces it's a global pandemic. <laughs> Dow Jones Industrial Average drops 1400 points. <laughs> NCAA tournament cancels uh, their tournament with fans. <laughs> Travel ban from Europe. NBA suspends its season. It's one thing after another. And then the last bomb drops as I'm going to bed. Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have COVID-19. I go to bed a little bit terrorized, somewhat afraid, definitely in, in, a little bit anxious, and I didn't sleep very well. And so the next morning I get up and I you know, get dressed and I'm walking my dog, Monty, and we go outside and you know, the sun is starting to come up in the east and the moon, I look up and the moon is waning in the in the western sky for a lot of reasons when i see the moon i think about my mom and i looked up and i said mom what would you do what would you say and i heard her voice as clear as bell honey just put it in your god's box and i laughed and i thought yeah that's what my mother would say you see my mother was one of these people who was really larger than life she was bold and beautiful and brilliant she was gracious and kind, and she moved easily and gently in the company of men, women, and children. Everybody loved her. She was just really larger than life. And um, she was also a great problem solver. And so people would turn to her and ask for her advice. And she was, you know, she may be wrong, but she was never uncertain. And people would often seek out what she had to say. But my mom had, a, my mom was also pragmatic, and she had one sentence that she would often say she says honey if you got a problem you can't solve it's not a problem it's a fact a global pandemic is a fact and i had to get to real with it and when my mother came across facts like that she didn't worry about them she put them in her god's box it wasn't her problem it was his and she wasn't going to worry about it she would just keep moving and that's what she expected us to do my mother it wasn't always easy to be her daughter. I mean, you know, she was like the big sun in the sky and I often felt like the little moon reflecting off of her light. And she was a good mother, but I wouldn't say she was mothering. I mean, it, 
parenting wasn't her calling. She saw it as a job and she took her job very seriously. I often kind of laugh when I hear people say, oh, I just want my children to be happy. Happy? Happy wasn't even on her, on her, you know, on her radar screen. It wasn't on her list. She wanted a lot of things. She wanted us to be kind and good and generous and thoughtful and ethical and brave and uh, considerate and polite. She had a long list. Happy wasn't on it. But more importantly, she wanted us to be fearless. She wanted us to be in the arena. She wanted us to always be enthusiastic and out there trying and doing new things. And as, anyway, as I'm walking Monty and I'm thinking about my mom, I thought, God, where did she teach courage? Because it's going to take courage to get through this pandemic. And a story or a memory came into my mind about, you know, a long time ago when I was, you know, five or six years old, maybe four or five, I can't remember. Um, I grew up along the North Shore of Chicago. For those of you familiar with it, it's, it's a lot of old communities with big old houses. And in those days, none of them had central air and it would be pretty hot in the summer. Some people would go up to their summer homes up in Michigan and Wisconsin, but many, or they would hang out at their club and by the swimming pool. But for the rest of us, we'd go down to the beach and my mom would call up her girlfriends and they'd organize a play date <clears throat> for themselves. And they'd meet down at the beach. They'd pack up all the buckets and the beach towels and the chairs and come on down to the beach. And then the mothers would line their, beach chairs along the shoreline with their feet in the water and they would chit chat with each other and scan the horizon watching the children in the water. And I loved the beach, I loved it. I would go up and I'd look for a little sea glass and I'd make sand castles and I love to paddle around in the water and I'd look longingly out to the raft thinking someday I'll be one of the big kids and able to swim out to the raft. But in those days, all I could do was just sort of splash around in the water. Now, Lake Michigan is a great lake, great lake. And those of you who are used to little lakes don't maybe appreciate what a great lake is about. I mean, it can be turbulent and wild. And I mean, there's been over, you know, 6,000 shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. And on this particular day, we were down on the beach and it was pretty wavy. And I loved it. I would go in and the water would knock me over and I'd laugh and I'd do it again and do it again. But what I didn't appreciate was that there was an undertow and the undertow kept pulling me further and further and further out until finally one time I stood up and my little feet didn't touch the ground and panic set in. I didn't know how to swim. So I was just swallowing water and I must have had a terrified look on my face because all the mothers noticed that I was in distress. One of them ran over to get the lifeguard, but mom didn't wait. She just went right out into the water to grab me and pick me up and bring me back to shore. And as we're coming back to shore, I was really quite hysterical and I was clinging to her the way you would expect a little monkey to cling to its mother. And she finally got to shore and she undid her arms and she put me down on the ground and she said, honey, you're just fine, stop crying. And I'd say, but mom, you know, I kind of kind of want to climb up back on her legs. And she said, no, 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 just stop crying. You're fine, you're fine, sweetie. Just stop crying, stop crying. <sighs> Finally, I was fine. I really was fine. And I calmed down and I was sort of settled. And then she took my hand and she said, honey, let's go back in the water. I thought she was crazy. I was like, no way. I don't want to go back in the water. And I was pulling in her and I started crying again. And she said, it's okay. I've got your hand. Come on, honey, let's go back in the water. And I was pulling and resisting, but, but you know, mom was mom and she pulled me back in and we were standing there just side by side and the water was splashing in and I probably was up to my knees in the water if that. And I was holding her hand, clinging to her really. And she just kept saying, honey, you're just fine. You're just fine. I've got your hand. There's nothing to worry about. I've got your hand. And in a few minutes, I was fine. Everything was fine. And I let go of her hand and I went running off the beach. And that was the day I think my mother taught me about courage. Because what she taught me was that courage and fear were completely intertwined. You can't have one without the other. Anyway, it came, that memory came back to me as I was walking Monty and I came back into my apartment and I hung up the leash and I began what was to become my nine month self-imposed shelter in place. And I looked up and I said, okay, mom, I'm gonna put it in my God's box. 
And in, our, in, my, in my mind, I heard her voice. Honey, you're going to be just fine. I'm right here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ann. And uh, you can tell what you're telling from the Windy City with that background you have there. Thank yeah, that's, you so that's our little beach. That's our little beach. Oh, that's where it happened. Yeah, that's where it happened. Well, now, folks, we're going to go on dry land after going in the ocean for a couple of stories. Our next storyteller, Lois Penn, came to the class with some acting experience and a lust for life. Lois's playfulness takes her on a whole new dimension in her story tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, here to introduce Lois Penn's story is none other than Lois Penn. Hi, Lois. So... Um, once a month, I Skype with my friend Bev. Bev is a dear friend from college, and she's now living in Australia. So we were talking one day in early September and remarking on how many college kids were getting in trouble for holding large parties during the pandemic. And we both agreed that if we were in college now, we would have been thrown out for violating the COVID reg regulations. And I think after hearing my story, you will probably agree too. Hannah. Oh, Lois, without further ado, we finally get to Lois. I was born in the early 1950s to very fearful and overprotective parents. I wasn't allowed to climb a jungle gym. I wasn't allowed to ride a horse. In fact, I even wasn't allowed to blow up a balloon for fear that I would inadvertently inhale suck the balloon into my lungs and choke to death. And what goes without saying is my parents needed to know where my whereabouts every single minute of every single day. Fast forward to the fall of 1969, the era of drugs, free love, and a war raging in Vietnam. I'm a freshman in college at Trenton State, which despite its name, was in a very safe and bucolic suburban setting. And for the first time, I was a freshman, and for the first time in my life, I was away from the watch of my parents. And I was like a bird out of a cage. The freedom was intoxicating. I drank a lot, I got high a lot, and I engaged in quite a bit of Oh, adventurous and some might say reckless behavior. But there's one incident that stands out above all the others. And that's my night in the barracks. So my partner in crime was a friend named Bev, another freshman, a very pretty, wholesome looking girl. Uh, looked like she came out of a milk commercial. And Bev grew up on a farm. She... Um, she was around a lot of animals, she had a lot of freedom, and she had a lot of experience with horses, including riding them. So our backgrounds were very different. But one thing that we had in common was a strong sense of adventure. So on this particular night, we are walking around campus, smoking our tarotins, decked down in our bell bottom pants and our tie dye t-shirts, and two soldiers from the local army base approach us, very nice looking guys in their starch uniforms and military crew cuts. They tell us that they're leaving for Vietnam the following week. Would we like to go back to the barracks with them? Bev says, yes. I say, hell yeah. And the four of us pack into, the, into their Volkswagen Beetle and off we go to the 20 minute ride to Fort Dix. Well, we drive up to the barracks. In those days, you could drive right up to the barracks. And our soldiers get out of the car. And there's, I would say, four to six privates guarding the entrance to the barracks. Well, our soldiers, being privates first class, went up to these guards and ordered them about face. They turn around, and with their backs to us, we march into the barracks. We go down a long gray concrete hallway, barely stifling our giggles. We get to their room, being privates first class, they had their own room, which was pretty austere. It consisted of shelves to hold their meager belongings, a TV, a small refrigerator, 
a very tightly made bunk bed, and a wall locker, which was not much bigger than a school locker. So we go into the room, Bev and I plop ourselves down on the, on the, very, on the bottom of the tightly made bunk bed. The soldiers open the refrigerator, they crack open four bottles of Budweiser, one for each of us. They also open a, uh, a bag of potato chips and we sit around, we're eating and drinking and making small talk. You know, the kind of banter that people make as a prelude to making out with a perfect stranger. Well, we weren't doing this for very long when all of a sudden there's a loud knock on the door. And before we know it, the soldiers are shoving us into the locker and shutting the door behind us. Now this was a small locker, so I am kneeling on the bottom and Deb is kneeling too, but she's sitting on my head. So the soldiers uh, open the door and they let in their sergeant. And from what I could tell, he sits down in the third chair. There were three metal chairs and uh, they give him a bottle of beer and they turn on the TV and they're shooting the breeze. Now, I would say the sergeant was probably there for about 50 to 20 minutes, but keep in mind, I was sweating. I felt like I was suffocating. I was barely breathing. I had somebody sitting on my head. I was nervous as anything and I was determined not to get caught. So what was 15 to 20 minutes really felt more like an eternity. Finally, the sergeant gets up and leaves. The soldiers open the door. Bev and I roll out of the, out of the locker. And the four of us all agree that it's probably best that we leave. So one of the soldiers opens the door to make sure that the hallway is clear. And when we have the all clear, we proceed to march back down the hallway the same way we came in, except we're no longer giggling. We get to the front door. Our soldiers tell the guards about face. They turn around and with their backs to us, we march out to the Beetle. We get in the car and proceed to drive for 20 minutes back to campus. I don't recall any of us saying one word the entire way back. We, we get back to campus. We get out of the car. We wish the soldiers good luck in Vietnam and we say good night. And Bev and I walk sheepishly back to our rooms. Well, do you think this escapade put an end to my reckless behavior? Hell yeah, for about a week. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Lois, and thanks for bringing back the far out days of the 60s. Yeah. Sorry about well, that little quirky thing at the end there. Did the video go back up after it went away for a second? Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, Technology. Okay, sorry. Thanks. Here you go, Chuck. Oh, back to you. Okay, folks. Our next newly minted storyteller is actually a very good friend. I tried to keep that on the down low for the rest of the group, but I think they figured it out. I've known Patrick Irwin for a few years through his leadership role in Men's Wisdom Works which is an organization of 18 different men's groups operating out of Ali. But I really got to know Patrick and enjoy his friendship on the golf course. Patrick's, Patrick's humor makes our golf game enjoyable or at the very least tolerable. Golf for us is an excuse for our sharing stories and deepening our friendships. Now, you might think this introduction is a little bit too much about golf, but I think you understand it when you hear Patrick's story. Folks, I present to you my good friend, Patrick Irwin. Good evening, everybody. My story also takes place in 1969. It's the summer and I'm sitting in a golf cart with my best friend, Edward Montford Fusick III, everybody called him Monty. And we're sitting and ready to tee off in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're there because I had gotten out of the service after three years, about a month before and Monty had just completed his graduate school. So we wanted to celebrate. So we thought, what the hell, let's go out to Las Vegas. So there we are. Now Monty was quite a character. 
He weigh, uh, weighed about 260 pounds, but was only 5'10". But he had an unusual uh, large hands and excellent eye-hand coordination. He was a great athlete. He could play pool, tennis, golf especially. And uh, he liked to wager on himself a lot. One of his favorite bets was whenever we were in a bar, he would challenge the bartender or the waitress that he could read, uh, excuse me, cite the entire label of a Budweiser bottle. Usually it worked out and we'd get free drinks. Another physical thing about Monty was he had a handlebar mustache that came about out to here. And whenever he started twisting that mustache, you knew he was getting ready to hustle you in some way for some type of bet. Well, anyhow, we, uh, we're getting ready to tee off and we've been paired with a couple of guys that were in their all mid forties and they come over to introduce themselves. And it turns out it's Tommy and Bruno. And they say, what are you guys doing there? And we tell them, and they said, well, we're Teamsters. We're here in Vegas at Caesars Palace for a convention over there at Jimmy's place. I assume that's Jimmy Hoffa. So we start playing. And like I said before, Monty's a very good golfer. But the, the first nine holes, he's not playing very well. In fact, I, I was beating it. So sure enough, at the nine holes, Bruno comes over to us. And he says, hey, you uh, college boys, uh, you interested in maybe a little wager for the last nine holes? And Monty says, what'd you have in mind? Well, how about, can you college boys handle $10 a hole each of you? Can you guys from the Teamsters handle $100 a hole? Now, in my pocket, I had maybe 80 bucks. So I'm starting to sweat big bull bullets at this point. And Monty's not playing well. Well, sure enough, he set up a con. Two hours later, we walk off the last nine holes and we won by three holes. Bruno comes over to give me three crisp $100 bills. He's not real happy looking at that point. And Monty says, hey, Bruno, uh, since we won the bet, uh, how about we go in here to the uh, clubhouse and I'll buy you a couple Budweiser's. And I'm thinking, oh no, now we're just gonna try to take these guys for another $100 or so. I've lost the screen, am I there? Okay. Um, I assume, I, okay. Okay, I'm back on screen. Well, it turns out that Tommy says, no, we have to go over and we've got a luncheon over there with Jimmy. And so we need to be uh, going now. And I'm thinking, Whew, that was good. That could have gotten really messy at the end. So we spent the less, rest of the afternoon spending some of the money we had won from these guys. But I'm constantly looking over my shoulder in case one of Bruno's friends shows up. And we end up in the desert out there for about three days you know, eating raw rattlesnake and, and trying to drink uh, cactus water, you know. But we made it through the afternoon. Now, this is our last day and night in Vegas. And when we first arrived, we realized that, that Elvis was uh, performing at the International Hotel. It's a brand new hotel, and they wanted to start off great by having the Elvis there. We had called to try to get reservations to see one of the shows. And they said, we're all booked up, can't get you in. However, if you came over about 11 o'clock for the midnight show uh, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, something like that in the middle of the week, you might get in if somebody doesn't show up. Just have a get in line there. So we said, okay, we'll give it a try. So that was that night. We, we went over to the International, had ourselves a nice little uh, dinner and, but it's like 8.30 and we didn't want to go over and get in line until maybe 10.30 or something like that. And Monty notices that there's a lounge there with some acts. So we'll decide we'll go over and, and check it out. Now I had been out of, the out of the country for about two and a half years and really wasn't up to date on the latest performers and that sort of thing. 
we go in there and the comedian comes out and he drops the F-bomb about every third word and it's Red Fox. This is before he had, had a TV show. Um, but we, he was pretty humorous and we made it through that part. And I'm looking at my watch and we still got plenty of time. And so the musical act comes out and it's this real tall black guy and uh, uh, the singer also was black and she was very good, kind of raspy voice and everything. And Monty says, you're gonna love this group. Well, they were very good. Now it's about, oh, a little after 10 o'clock. I said, Monty, maybe we ought, to, we ought to go ahead and get in line there. He says, you don't want to miss the final song these people are going to sing. So, okay. So we played a couple more songs. Then it was their final song. It was Proud Mary. It was I Can Tina Turner. The place went crazy. I couldn't believe it. So now I've already seen Red Fox and I can Tina Turner, and we're going to try to go get in uh, line for uh, see Elvis. I go over there and I get in line. I said, Monty, I'll, I'll get in line. I'll wait uh, if you want to go gamble a little bit. So I'm standing there and I'm maybe sixth or seventh in line. Maybe we got a shot. There's a sign there that says, there'll be no beverage services during Elvis's performance. You need to order your drinks for the during the opening act to drink minimum. It's okay, all right. So now it's about midnight and all the people have passed by us that already got seats and everything and we're still waiting in line. Now it's midnight and they left one door open and they motioned for people to start coming in to the theater, the showroom. A couple people go in, a couple more people. Now it's our turn. We wait about two minutes, then they said, come on in. We come in there and there is the room captain. Are you gentlemen to see, here to see Mr. Presley today? Well, Monty had already figured out the best way to get any kind of seats was to tip the guy. And he had a $10 bill in his hand and he kind of waved it under this guy's nose and without even looking down, got grabbed. An usher was started to take us to our seats. Now in Vegas, in this particular theater, you had three sets of seats. The upper level were all a bunch of tables facing the uh, uh, stage. Then in the middle were all these luxurious padded booths, half circle berth, booths you could watch straight ahead at the acts. And down below that, where again, a bunch of tables all lined up straight into the stage. Well, we're walking down and sure enough, the usher takes us past the, the high seats, past the padded booths and sets us right down, right center stage at the end of one of these tables for a great place to be. So we're sitting down and uh, Monty says, holy crap. I'm thinking, yeah, Monty, these are tremendous seats. I can't believe we got this lucky. He says, turn around. I turn around and there's Bruno in one of the booths with a couple of his big buddies. And he's pointing right at us. Now everybody's been seated. We're probably the last one seated. And just before the lights go out to introduce the comedian, one of Bruno's friends gets up out of the booth and starts walking toward us. Now the lights go out and the announcer saying, please welcome our comedian. I don't remember the guy's name. He's just completed a successful tour of the Midwest where he was in Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Wichita, and I'm thinking, get on, get the lights back up on the house. I, uh, this, we're going to get murdered here. You know, there's going to be blood everywhere. They're going to have to uh, slow down the performances. Everybody's going to be pissed at us, but we'll be dead. It won't matter that much. Omaha, 
Death Moin. I swear he said Death Moin. And finally at that point, I feel this on my shoulder. And a voice says, well boys, the lights go back up. I look up, it's our waiter. What do you guys be drinking tonight? Well, we ordered our drinks. Comedian came out, did his thing, and then Elvis came out, and it was one hell of a show. At the time, he had not performed a lot but in a live concert in eight years. And so he's kind of making a comeback, and he was in great shape, sang a lot of his old tunes from the 50s and early 60s, and then he uh, included uh, some of his more recent ones at that time. It was um, Suspicious Minds, um, uh, a couple others. He even did a, a, a Beatles song yesterday. He was just tremendous. And near the final was, he did Johnny Be Good. And everybody got out of their seats. We were dancing, carrying on. Well, show finally ends and everything. And I want to get the hell out of there in case Bruno and some of his buddies were looking for us. Well, just at the end of the show, I noticed that in, toward the front, right in front of the stage, usually there were a bunch of women that they placed there. And at the end of the show, they start throwing undergarments and keys, room keys up on the stage. <laughs> well, the show ends and I'm looking for the exit. Monty says, he, he starts going toward the stage. I said, Monty, what are you doing? He says, I'm gonna look for one of those keys. I said, no, 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 we're out of here, we're out of here. So we got out of there. And um, like I said, mine was my best friend through our adult lives and everything. We probably went there four or five times uh, with wives, of course, later on. And every time we'd go back, we'd always talk about that day and that night. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And by the way, Patrick, I'll see you tomorrow on the 19th hole at the Muni. Yes. <laughs> Thanks again. Uh, folks, uh, we still have two tellers to go. We might run a little bit over, but I promise you, I promise you, it is worth waiting for. Our next teller is a very special Ali member. Uh, you probably know him through his other creative endeavors. Bill LaRock is an Ali treasure. His pencil drawings, his cartoons, and especially his caricatures bring Ali members to life. Along with his published political cartoons, Boomer Bill's an experienced storyteller on paper with pencil, not live with a microphone. So telling via the spoken word was a whole new gig for Bill. And folks, I'm here to tell you, I have never had a learner in any of my classes work so hard to learn this craft. And I think you'll agree after hearing that this is hard work definitely paid off. So folks, all the way from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, here's Boomer Bill, the rock. Bill? Are you seeing the video, Chuck? You are muted, but if you could give me a thumbs up, yeah, that's it, It's just starting. Okay. I uh, slowly realized uh, over the years that uh, grandparents are very important. Uh, not just being one, but... Uh, about our own, knowing our own grandparents. And I do portraits uh, occasionally. And one of the things you have to remember is to get the outline uh, just right. Uh, we are shaped by our silhouette or our outline. Uh, and I believe that's what our families do. Uh, later on, we fill in all the details as we live our lives, but our parents, and especially I've learned and realized over uh, over time that uh, my grandparents were extremely important. Going back to the beginning, uh, when I was just a little baby, my parents uh, left a copy of my birth certificate uh, by my crib. And uh, when I got my hands on it, I realized that the whole foundation of my life was all right there. Wit, art, outdoors and stories. Right at the top was my name. William V for Virgil LaRock. Uh, the Virgil is really what this story is all about, my grandfather. But uh, when I was in the second grade and had to introduce myself, people would say, what is the V for? 
And I would tell them and they would say, huh, or they would laugh or they'd push me down or uh, pick on me. So I had to learn to use my wit. And so I would then say vampire because that was the only other V word I knew. And so he really was helping me right at the beginning with a little bit of wit. Um, my mother's name was there and on it was her maiden name Downs. Uh, and that came to shape a big part of my life, as you'll see. Uh, my father's name, which is also William, is on there. And he was uh, um, very responsible for encouraging, encouraging me early uh, with uh, art. Uh, then at the bottom of the birth certificate was the location. It was Buffalo, New York in February. Yikes. Uh, so I started packing, getting dressed, and getting out of there as quickly as possible. And it turned out that uh, fate uh, made that possible. Uh, we were in the uh, beginning parts of the war in Europe, and my father was uh, called and uh, went to serve there. And my mother went to live with her parents uh, on a huge uh, estate, really a manor uh, farm, in southern Massachusetts, um, underneath uh, Cape Cod. It was a 22 room home, no nails, all big giant pegs, um, um, over 200 years old, on, situated on a thousand acres of um, woodland, fields, and a couple of miles of beach right there. Um, so I came to understand that as my home uh, before I knew very much. Um, it turned out that uh, my luck and the reason that I was there started a long time ago before that in New York City, uh, where my grandparents uh, met and married. He was sort of a downtown boy and she was an uptown lady uh, that was the matron, uh, a companion back when they had such things of a wealthy matron artist uh, who lived in Gramercy Park. Um, later on, after they were married and their two children were born, they, uh, the, uh, the matron uh, asked my grandmother and uh, my grandfather to manage the property up in Massachusetts. And so they uh, relocated their lives and uh, they, neither one of them had done anything with farming. So off they went to all those fields and it was, they had livestock and a lot of uh, a lot of hard work. It's uh, farm farming is not idyllic. So this uh, brings me to Virgil, my grandfather, and uh, he was a tough and grumpy old man. To uh, you can see, I think uh, a picture beside me. Um, so maybe over half of his life has already gone by uh, by the time uh, I arrived. I was, uh, I guess, one or two years old, maybe two. Um, he was uh, not a big guy. He was uh, slight. He was hard of hearing. He had uh, false teeth. He had cut off one of his thumbs in an accident. And every fourth word was a swear word, a PG swear word. But nevertheless, my grandmother hated that. And so whenever we were in the parlor with company, um, he would have to cease that plus smoking his beloved camel cigarettes. Um, by the time I was toddling, which is that kind of wobbly walk that two and three year olds do, uh, I was uh, with him all day and I would go alongside him. Um, he would take me, carry me up a ladder onto the roof uh, to put on tar paper. Um, we would uh, go to his shop, which I always loved his shop, uh, see all his tools and how he fixed things. Uh, we'd go gathering eggs uh, from underneath very unhappy hens. Uh, I was scared to death of the pigs, but learned to live with them as we go feed them. After big storms, we'd gather scallops and uh, on the beaches. And on Sunday nights, we'd listen to his uh, Zenith console radio. And I still love radio today. Um, one of the great things about uh, grandparents and being a grandparent, as many of you may know, is telling stories 
And I guess uh, that's why we've enjoyed this class so much. Uh, they are sort of nourishing lessons that are served up with a sauce of humor and excitement and uh, maybe in the way we tell the story, but grandparents and stories go together. And I first uh, gained a love of stories from listening to my grandfather. He was uh, hardworking all day, but his one joy was going fishing on the Westport River Bridge uh, about uh, 10 miles away. And that was a, um, at that time, an old wooden bridge uh, over a very fast running deep river where the, uh, the men, mostly men, uh, would come and fish for striped bass, which are quite large um, there. Uh, he had a fishing pole that was sort of like a telephone pole. Uh, the line was very thick. The hooks were big, and we used uh, these eight, nine-inch sea worms, which could bite you if you weren't careful. Um, the men all had their favorite spot along the bridge and would sometimes notch uh, the railing where they was their lucky spot. And so they would talk and fish and change their gear and um, tell stories. And when I got older, I got to go with them. But uh, many nights, uh, not many nights, actually just a few, um, when my grandfather would catch one of these very large fish, uh, he, the other fishermen would have to pull up their lines and he would walk down to the far end of the bridge where there was a little beach where they could pull the fish in. And some of the uh, Portuguese farmers there uh, would help him throw these uh, great treasures in the back uh, of the, his back seat or in his trunk. And then the next uh, 10 years, uh, 10 miles, he would be driving back to the farm. And we would hear him when he'd get about a mile away, he'd start honking his horn. And we knew there'd be some great stories coming. So those were uh, some of the many happy events and times that I had growing up with my grandfather on, um, living on his farm. Uh, fast forward a little bit that uh, when I went away to school, we were living fairly nearby, about 50, 60 miles away. And uh, I was off at college, and when I was home, they said uh, my grandfather was very ill. And so I went to visit, and uh, I guess somewhat uh, fortunately, he was uh, had lost so much weight that uh, I barely recognized him, and he didn't recognize me. So in some ways, uh, that made it easier for me. But it was the first uh, family member that I had ever lost. And so I felt very, very sad for a long time uh, and missed him. Um, every time I sign my name with that V, I remember him. His signature has appeared on, uh, I guess, thousands of cartoons and um, book signings and uh, uh, real estate deals and all kinds of places. But the V has always brought back a memory of my grandfather. Um, I remember in school, we used to say, um, when we discovered something interesting, we'd pass it along or pass it on. Uh, and that was sort of a vertical way, uh, which we uh, uh, teased people and informed on people or just uh, um, let information go back and forth. But I've learned uh, that uh, there's a, it's important to pass things on vertically. And that means uh, passing along this story to my family and to my sons especially. Uh, my grandfather used to uh, have three important lessons that, I've, that have stuck with me. And uh, as uh, I've gotten older, I've learned how sound they were. The first was um, always have a good foundation. Now that sounds easy, but basically what I've learned uh, from that is to do my research carefully. Um, cartoons, especially political cartoons, uh, can be uh, uh, kind of easy to think up, but if they're not on target, if they're not correct, then uh, they won't be well received. He used to also say that uh, dull knives uh, aren't worth a damn, and he's right. 
And that also goes for a dull wit. So if you uh, aren't able to uh, come up with something that is truly witty um, or clever, uh, people just won't pay attention. And he also used to say that a poor carpenter blames his tools. And that's so true. Uh, I've learned all through life that uh, it's important to use your tools and get familiar with them and become expert and to practice, practice, practice. So uh, that V and Virgil have followed me. I've got his picture of him right in front of me now as I'm talking. I wish he could hear. I would thank him for all of our good times together. Um, um, the stories he told me and the love of stories. Fishermen tell the best stories. Um, the lessons that he gave me. And uh, I will always remember you, Virgil, with that V uh, in the middle of my name. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Very well told. Wonderful. And that story actually hits home. My wife is from Westport, Massachusetts, which is where that bridge takes place. And you see those thumbs going up. That's Cindy. Uh, also, uh, he mentioned radio. And I just want to give a quick plug for that sign behind me, WPVM. I have a show called Storyville, and it's on WPVM every Wednesday. And that should reach maybe 30 people. It's a community radio station. But you'll also find it on my YouTube channel, Chuck Fink Storyteller on YouTube. And you'll see we have interviews with some spectacular storytellers like Gwenda Ledbetter is up there currently. Michael Reno Harrell is going to appear in uh, January. So I encourage you to check that out on YouTube. Tonight, our final, t our final teller, excuse me, thanks to Zoom, comes to you from her new home in Helena, Montana. Judy Keeler actually moved to Helena from Asheville in the sixth week of her eight-week class. Thank goodness for Zoom, huh? <laughs> Well, Judy brought her smarts, charm, and a special type of emotional intelligence to our class. Tonight, Judy shares with you that part of herself in a beautiful and profound story. Her story clues us to her motivation for her new role in her new place. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute honor to round out tonight's showcase with the compassion of Judy Keeler. Judy? Thank you, Chuck. Dear Grandpa, I know it's been a while since I've written to you, but you've been on my mind a lot lately. I just heard a great storyteller talking about grandpas and the legacy of our ancestors. And that so touched my heart when I thought about you and the legacy that you gifted to me. It's interesting that sometimes we don't realize the legacy until decades later and how it weaves its way into our lives and makes such a difference. One thing I need to tell you is that in my life, I've had a really difficult time dealing with the emotions of death and dying and funerals. It's been a hard thing for me and one that I've avoided and felt great fear and great anxiety about. But I decided to kind of suck it up and use my curiosity to figure out why I felt that way. We celebrate life. We celebrate birth with all kinds of exciting things. When we come into this earth with form, we celebrate that. I wanted to know why it was so difficult to celebrate when we became formless, when we died and there wasn't the celebration for a life well lived. So I started wondering, and lo and behold, as the universe does, it started presenting me with opportunities to learn more and more about the death and dying process. So much so that I ended up becoming an end of life doula. Now I know grandpa, you're probably wondering what is an end of life doula? Well, an end-of-life doula helps people prepare for death, hopefully well ahead of their actual passing time, but also during their passing time and afterwards and making plans. It brings death, it opens that closet door, brings death, sets it on the table, 
and really gives families an opportunity to sit there and talk about it and plan for an intentional end of life. His name was Otto and Otto was my grandfather. My grandfather used to call me little girl. He told me Otto was spelled backwards and forwards the same. I remember him so clearly. He was a son of German immigrants and he had three sisters. He also had his mother, his wife and he had my mother. And then my mother had me, his only granddaughter. He was a very special man. He lived in Ohio and the street that he lived on was as a street lined with trees. And he lived in one half of a red brick duplex. And this red brick duplex had steps going up to the porch. There was a beautiful swing on the porch that we used to sit in and swing on. One thing I knew for sure though, is every time I walked through that front door, he would be there waiting for me. His arms open wide, I would run up to him. He would grab me in his arms and I felt so safe and secure. I could feel the whiskers on his cheek. When I pushed my head into his cheek, I could smell the pipe tobacco smell on him. He wore wire frame glasses, kind of thinning gray hair. Seemed like he always had on a sweater or a vest, but when he held me in his arms, I felt so safe and loved. I would often spend the night with he and grandma and we would sit in the living room and we would listen to the radio and we would listen to either the Grand Old Opry or we would listen to the shadow. I can still remember the creaking sound of the door in the shadow. One of the things that was a treat was we always got to have ice cream and grandpa and I ate out of the same bowl, the chocolate ice cream. The only, different being, the only difference being is he was drinking a beer at the same time that he was eating his ice cream. One of my favorite parts of his house was outside in the backyard. Now I must tell you that the backyard seemed huge to me, but I'm looking at it from the perspective of about five years old. So it could have been actually quite small, but there were trees growing everywhere in the backyard. And grandpa would take my little hand in his and my hand would disappear. And we'd walk around that backyard and over to a weeping willow tree. He would sit down at the base of that weeping willow tree and I would hop up onto his lap and he would wrap his arms around me. And again, I would nuzzle my nose into his neck Pipe, pipe tobacco smell, whiskers. It was all about love. He would tell me stories as we were sitting there under this tree about things in the yard, about plants, about the trees, about the birds, about the flowers. But the one thing that I always remember is I probably did a lot of the talking too. I would ask grandpa question after question after question. And he was my go-to man. He always had the answers for me. The other thing that was so special about that yard was that in the fall, the trees lost all of their leaves. And so grandpa would always hand me a rake and he and I would go out there and we would rake those leaves up into huge piles. And I would run and jump into the pile and there would be leaves going everywhere. And I can remember the twinkle in his eye and the smile and the laugh as he raked those leaves up over and over for me. At the end of the day, we would grab those leaves up. We would take them out to the street and grandpa would burn the leaves. That's back when it was legal. And it's a smell that to this day, I can still remember. When I smell burning leaves, it takes me right back to those days with my grandpa and fall in Ohio. One of the special things that happened during the summer was that grandpa and grandma would rent a cottage on Indian Lake. And my older brother always got to go and I never did. Well, one year it was finally my turn and I got to go. I was so excited. I knew that 
spending a week with grandpa was going to be just wonderful. Well, the first morning that we got there, grandpa came out of the cottage, fishing pole in hand, tackle box, and he says, come on, little girl, you and I are going fishing. I'll show you how. And that day I learned to fish. Grandpa showed me the pole. He taught me how to reel it in. He taught me how to put the line through the eyes, how to put on the red bobbin that was the indicator that I would know I had a fish, a little piece of lead at the end so that the line would go down to the bottom of the water, and then a hook. And then he says, okay, little girl, go get that little white box off the table over there because that's where the worms are. So a little box looking like a Chinese carryout box. I brought that over to grandpa and he opened the lid and I looked in there and there were tons of worms in there. And he says, okay, get one out for me. So I pull out this worm and I hand it to grandpa. Well, he bit out, he took off a little piece and put it on the hook and put the rest back into the container. Then he took the pole and he heaved that line out into the lake, kerplop. And I could see the ripples on the water of where the line went in. Grandpa handed me the pole and he said, okay, little girl, you hold on to this and we'll wait and see what happens. Well, Grandpa went and got his chair and he got his beer and he came and he sat down next to me and we waited and we waited and we waited. It seemed like an eternity before that bobbin started to go up and down into the water. And next thing you know, the bobber disappeared and he goes, okay, little girl, you've got a fish, reel it in. So I reeled it in and I reeled it in and lo and behold, there was a fish on the end of the line. Well, this is a fish story, so maybe the fish was more like this. Anyway, we pulled it up and it was a catfish. And grandpa said, you have to be really careful, little girl, with these catfish because they have whiskers and they'll hurt you. So he took the pole, took the catfish off. He filleted the catfish right there. And we had catfish for dinner that night. It was the best trip I've ever had. A week with grandpa, we fished every day and caught lots of fish. When I was in third grade, my mom came and picked me up at school. I knew something was wrong because mom never came to pick me up at school. When I got in the car, she said, your grandfather died last night in his sleep. I didn't really know what that meant. I hadn't ever lost anybody. I didn't, I didn't know anybody that had died before my grandfather. I didn't know what that meant. The only time I'd heard about death was in church with Jesus. And Jesus came back. He didn't really die. So I didn't know what to expect. Mom told me that she would be busy over the next days taking care of grandma and arranging for the funeral. And I would have to find things to do to keep busy. I had question after question after question and nobody to ask. I tried to ask my older brother. He didn't really want anything to do with me. And so I just, I wondered what was going to happen. What was this all about? The morning of the funeral, my dad took me to the funeral home and I walked in and there was the strangest smell in this place. For all of the flowers that were there, I thought it would have smelled so sweet and so nice. And it was a smell that I don't think I'll ever forget. My dad walked me up to the coffin and I looked inside and there was a man laying there, but it wasn't my grandfather. My mom and my grandmother were talking about whether or not they should put his glasses on him. Would he look more natural? Would he look more natural? There was a man laying in this coffin with a suit on and his eyes were closed and his hands were folded. There was no pipe tobacco smell. There were no whiskers. There was no sign that this was my grandfather. I can remember going and sitting in a corner and the questions just kept going over and over in my head. And I realized that I had nobody to ask. I'd like to tell you 
that in the next years of my life, my experience with death got better, but it didn't. I didn't handle the death of my mother very well. I didn't handle the death of my father very well. Death was something that was kept in the closet in our family. There was no talking about it. There was no planning for it. And there was certainly was no discussion about what people wanted when they passed. Well, I believe in the phrase that when you know better, you do better. So grandpa, I've tried to do better. I've taken some classes and I realize that yes, I am going to die, but I do have control over how I do that. And it's with intentionality that I want to die. I want to be balanced physically, emotionally, spiritually, and practically. I want the people around me, the loved ones of my life, to be part of a celebration of a life well lived. So grandpa, you can see that the legacy that you left me has been put to good use. I hope to be able to help other people also discern an intentional death for them. I miss you, Grandpa. You were the most important part of my life. You got me when nobody else did. I love you. Signed, your little girl. Oh, Judy, that's such a beautiful way to end out the show. Just absolutely lovely. Folks, I hope that you've enjoyed listening and watching these wonderful tellers and delightful people as they took the stage as storytellers for the first time. On one hand, I hope it's a start of many performances to follow for them. But on the other hand, I really need to step up my game just to keep pace with these wonderful people. So I thank my wonderful half dozen heroes for strutting their stuff for you tonight. And the seven of us thank all of you for gathering around the Zoom campfire to hear from my six graduates and their profiles and creative courage. Thank you all. Have a pleasant night and drive home safely. Oh, wait, you're on Zoom. Good night, everybody.